I do love me some digitised voice. So yes, welcome back to the Let's Play Klonoa thread, where we are now getting started on the first Game Boy Advance entry, Empire of Dreams. It's time to get deep. Yeah, spoilers, the story of this game is really stupid. So yes, when we dream, we go to other worlds. This was but this was the basic message of Daughter Phantom Isle. And occasionally we do great deeds in those worlds. But we cannot but we cannot stay in those worlds. So, this time our dream has brought us to this world. Where Klonoa has been arrested for dreaming. This is pretty much gonna be the series' This is pretty much the series' go-to story from this point forward. Bagu is totally not evil in the slightest. And here's Hupo for absolutely no reason. Remember in Daughter Remember in Daughter Phantom Isle he was supposed to be the prince of the Moon Kingdom and he had to stay in the Moon Kingdom and we couldn't stay there. Yeah, he's just following us around now. For no explained reason. And thus begins the first of many things that will make me very, very angry about this game's story. So this is our world map. Remember, remember, Bagu said there were five, there were four monsters terrorizing the land, but we have five worlds, so... Fair to say, four lackeys and then the big guy who's behind it all. I love the character, but there's something very funny and very satisfying about Klonoa just getting randomly punched in the face. This game is funny, if nothing else. on the left there kind of reminds me of Bomberman. Anyway, gameplay. Things are a little different in this game. First of all, we're full bore side scrolling. There's no 3D effects in this in this game cuz it's it's just the Game Boy Advance. Come on. This is reiterating all the stuff we know from Daughter Phantom Isle. You can grab enemies, use them to double jump, throw them around, all that jazz. Every level has 30 uh, dreamstones. 
There's probably a bonus for collecting them all, but I'm not worrying about collecting them all. I will collect them all if I can, but I'm not going to beat myself up if I miss any. That said, I will get OCD if I see one I know how to get and can't get. But the basic structure of the level is, in every level there are three, three of those six-pointed stars. When we collect all three, it'll unlock the exit door. And that's all we have to worry about, just finding finding the stars and getting to the exit. We get that lovely little bell ring when we've grabbed the third one. And there's the door. Obviously being a portable game, the levels in this game are going to be qu are quite a bit shorter than they were in Door to Phantom Isle. There are going to be no 20 minute marathons. And here's our first new element. The box. The box functions just like any other enemy we'd see around. Except we can use them over and over again. They don't, they don't die and we don't have to wait for them to respawn. And they can be there and we can use them as steps. There's a lot of different ways to use boxes, and it comes into a lot of the game's puzzles in that you just have to figure out how to use the boxes properly. The music in this game is alright. It's nothing compared to Door to Phantom Isle, especially when we've pretty much got the same track running through all the levels in a given world. So there's not a whole lot of variation. But for the most part our controls are exactly the same as Door to Phantom Isle. We have a jump button, we have uh, the wind bullet button, and that's it. If you get to the door but don't have all three of the stars, you will just straight up won't be able to go through. You won't even be able to walk in front of the door and it just stays closed. You just can't get in there. Because we missed that there. And the bronze coin, still an extra life. Because there are only 30 gems in a given world, and gems and gems don't carry over between work between levels extra lives are a lot harder to come by in this game the only way to get them pretty much is through finding the extra life coins complete a level unlock another level with what appears to be a dual moon in the background. There are some lovely backgrounds in this game. The whole... a lot of the art design of this game I'm very fond of, just because if there's one thing I love in a 2D game, it's a nice big sprite. And that signpost teaches us about keys. We had keys in Door to Phantom Isle, but they were very, very sparingly used. I think we saw three in the course of the whole game. In this game, they're much more of a integral mechanic. And there are two kinds. In fact, I think there might be three kinds later on, but for now, just two kinds of keys. Most levels where you find keys will have two. Will have two. Like, there's never one key to rule everything. That's one of the basic box puzzles there. Just We can't carry the box under so we have to throw it throw it throw it over to where we need it each key only opens its own type of door which is a nice thing i think as our final star like i said there's a much greater focus on 
puzzles in this game. There's a lot of tricky platforming, but for the most part, the main challenge of the game comes from figuring out how you're supposed to get to a certain area. And with having to collect the stars to unlock the exit, that becomes an integral part of the game instead of just... It becomes an integral part of the game rather than just finding bonuses. Speaking of bonuses... Ladies and gentlemen, it is time. This is the hoverboard. More specifically, this is the rocket-powered hoverboard. We can do everything with this thing that we can do in regular platforming. Except flutter jump, I believe. If we jump when we go over those ramps, we'll get a nice little boost. We can shoot enemies with a wind bullet and carry them along and use them to get a double jump. But there's very little danger, although you can die in these levels. Enemies will still deal damage. And enemies are also riding, riding hoverboards, which I find absolutely adorable. Completing one bonus unlocks the next, and another, and another level. But yeah, the only real function of the only real function of the bonus levels is just getting just getting pickups. Like it's it's a pure it's a pure game challenge. I don't think you actually have to complete them to unlock the boss level. But they're a lot of fun, generally. Not all the bonus levels are hoverboard related. We'll be seeing we'll be seeing a few kinds of bonuses. So now boxes are starting to get a bit trickier. We have two. And a lot of area to get up to. So if we stack the boxes up like this, kind of a staircase arrangement, and we're very free to arrange the boxes how we like. They're not they're not locked into boxes are not locked into like appearing on certain squares. So we can use them to make staircases like that. It is allowed and positively encouraged. And I think one of the key points of this level is actually teaching you that you can use boxes that way. And another new element. Goomies basically act as, as grab rails. We can use them to hang about wherever we need and effectively jump infinitely. This whole kind of uh, element in a platformer is something I always really like just because I've always loved um, like hanging rails and swinging across rails as a kid and as a quote-unquote grown-up. And when I have the... and when a game gives me the opportunity to just jump from one suspended point to another, it's something I find a lot of fun. Even though it's, even though it's really mechanically simple, it's, it's very pleasing as a thing to do, just jumping from one point to another without touching the ground. that door we find a box. So 
the box across. We can use the box to get that key. The box is now outlived its usefulness. And all we need it for is just to unlock this little shortcut back to the exit. There are quite a few levels like that later in this game that are that are cir circular, effectively. Like You will often start next to the exit and will effectively run a lap around the level. So this is a new type of bonus game. And again, can still lose lives. Falling behind and getting crushed by the screen will force us to lose a life. Obviously, losing all our hearts will lose a, will lose a life. Falling down a pit will lose a life. So the emphasis here is just quick platforming. But as well as the quick platforming, there's a lot of stuff with uh, gems and extra lives that's put there to tempt you into taking risks. Like stop you from just blasting ahead to get to the end of the level. And occasionally it can get pretty hairy. Like falling a bit too close to the edge of the screen in pursuit of those in pursuit of a full hundred gems. But really it's just a pure platforming challenge. And the rush to grab all the gems and all the bonuses that are dotted around. This is often where most extra lives come from. Makes these a lot of fun. Not not quite as fast and exciting as hoverboard. But still a welcome it's a welcome break just to have this kind of pure platforming breaking up the exploration the exploration stages. Also some lovely jaunty music going on. Obviously it's only World 1, so this one isn't terribly difficult. But rest assured, these are going to start getting quite a bit harder the further we go. And I very nearly screwed it up there, getting... Nearly missing that platform, and at the end of it, we get fired out of the cannon. For seemingly absolutely no reason. It's just, hey, end of a bonus level, we're going to fire you out of a cannon. So the seventh and final regular level of this world. And this level opens up with quite a bit of early distraction. Obviously the immediate the immediate focus here is going to be that key. Which is easy enough to get. But obviously there's other stuff. There's going to be other stuff up here. I mean, the, the trail goes both ways. So let's grab this guy. We got the box making up a staircase there. Let's go across here. And there's a star just out of our reach. The nail follows some time of me trying to figure out how the hell I'm supposed to get up to that star. Because we need the box to get at that. We need the box to get at that large gap. We need the enemy to get at the next large gap. We just can't quite get the boost we need. 
So I start thinking, if I put the box on the platform, that will give me a bigger boost with the enemy. It doesn't quite work like that, and then I start trying to throw the box up here, which doesn't work because when you throw it, it goes parallel with Klonoa's, Klonoa's body rather than staying above him. So eventually, screw it, we'll figure it out later. And we get our first look at the springs. The springs, springboards had a minor role in Daughter Phantom Isle, mainly they pretty much only appeared in the forest. Which was a shame, because as a platformer fan for many years, I've grown very fond of springboards in all their forms. And I kind of wish they'd been used more in Doors of Phantom Isle. It is, in my opinion, quite a technical marvel, this game. Just from how much of Daughter Phantom Isle, a PS1 game, they were able to fit in. I mean, you saw at the title screen, they kept the... You saw at the title screen, they kept the series' opening sting. Opening little musical sting. The same from the PS1. A lot of Klonoa's... A lot of little voice clips made it in. Oh, and by the way, that's how we get that star. Once again, circular level. I'm pretty sure that was only put there to mess with people. Seven action. Yeah, thanks for that, Hooper. Jump into the screen and into the arena. So same as with the bosses in Daughter Phantom Isle, there are just moos randomly wandering around. If we throw an enemy at the front of him, it's not that he's armoured, it's just that he'll block it with his spikes. And of course, shockwaves. Because a boss isn't a real boss without shockwaves. Three hits though and he's dealt with. And after a brief burst of pixelation... had a dream. We are uncovering things. Could there be a conspiracy afoot? So that's it for here. I'll see you next time in Priamel. <laughs>